is the 22nd broadcast in the series, America Looks Abroad, presented by the officers and staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. This nonpartisan organization, open to all who are interested in American foreign policy, offers accurate information on current world events. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. Germany's campaign in Scandinavia appears to be a sharp departure from its previous policy. What is the significance of this new move? Mr. John C. DeWilde, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, speaking to you from WFIL Philadelphia, will discuss Germany's war aims in Scandinavia. Mr. DeWilde. Good afternoon. The invasion of Scandinavia marks a dramatic turning point in the war. Up to a week ago, it seemed as if the belligerents were settling down to a passive war of attrition. It had become fashionable to call it a sit-down war. The Allies had found no way to get at Germany, except through the blockade. They had hoped to create new theaters of war in Scandinavia and the Near East. But the conclusion of the Finnish war appeared to put an end to such a prospect in the north. And the chances of opening up a new front in the Balkans were none too bright. True, the Nazis had repeatedly threatened the Allies with a smashing offensive. But most observers discounted such threats. By refusing to fight on a large scale, the Germans seemed to be playing a clever game. They had already conquered what they wanted in the east of Europe, and it was up to the Allies to dislodge them. If Germany could simply hold France and Britain at bay, she could conserve her limited strength. By devoting her energy to building up supply lines to Russia and the Balkans, Germany seemed to have a fairly good chance of outstaying the Allies. Now, why did Germany change her tactics? It is hardly likely that she embarked on this Scandinavian adventure lightheartedly. Not, of course, that the Nazis had any scruples about violating the neutrality of the northern countries. German planes and U-boats had already sunk and machine-gunned a large number of neutral ships, many of them without warning and in flagrant violation of international law. No, the Nazis hesitated only because they knew that an invasion of Denmark and Norway was a hazardous undertaking. Presumably, they had weighty reasons for doing so. Some observers still believe that a German invasion took place only after the Allies mined Norwegian territorial waters in order to interrupt shipments of Swedish iron ore. That interpretation, however, doesn't seem correct. While we don't know exactly when the mines were laid, the announcement of this action came early on April 8th, and only one day later, German troops had landed at the Norwegian iron ore port Narvik, which is well over a thousand miles from German territory. But the Germans did have reason to fear the ultimate effect of allied pressure on Scandinavia. Presumably, they drew up detailed plans for the invasion of the northern countries during the Finnish war, when the British and French were on the point of armed intervention. The Russo-Finnish War put an end to this threat for a time, but it soon appeared that the Allies were determined to deal more sternly with the neutrals. Winston Churchill and other British statesmen called on the neutrals to join in the war against German aggression. They issued sharp warnings that the Allies couldn't be expected to respect neutral rights if Germany did not. Preparations were made to tighten the blockade. The Altmark incident last February and subsequent Allied breaches of Norway's neutrality indicated that the French and British would no longer tolerate the use of Norwegian territorial waters for the purpose of evading the blockade. And the Allies were determined to compel the Scandinavian countries to reduce their shipments to Germany, particularly of Swedish iron ore. France and Britain were in the position to hold, withhold vital overseas supplies from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark unless they complied with Allied demands. With their customary decisiveness, the Germans undertook to anticipate these developments. Should a desperate gamble succeed, the Nazis would harvest important gains. First of all, they would acquire in southern Norway air and submarine bases which are much closer to northern England and Scotland. These would enable Germany to take more effective action against the British blockade in the North Sea and to harass British shipping more constantly. 
Scapa Flow, the most important British naval base, could be reached in only a little more than an hour's flying. Secondly, the conquest of Scandinavia would be an object lesson to the Balkans, a warning of the fate they could expect if they resisted German claims to monopolize their foodstuffs and minerals. Thirdly, and this is most important, the Nazis would acquire complete control of Scandinavia's mineral resources. Sweden and Norway have some copper and molybdenum, and a bit of nickel and tungsten, all ores which Germany needs for the prosecution of the war. But above all, the rich iron ore deposits way up in the north of Sweden and Norway would fall into German hands. For Germany, access to this high-grade ore is a matter of life or death. In the World War, she could supply 70% of her own needs in iron. She had the iron of Lorraine, Lorraine and soon conquered the Brie Basin in France, another important source of supply. But, to, but today, her own iron mines supply only about a third of her requirements. She has quite a bit of ore, but it is not easy to mine and difficult to smelt because of its high acid and low lime content. So if Germany succeeds in conquering Norway, she will cut Sweden off completely from the Allies. Sweden will then have no alternative but to deliver her entire surplus to Germany. Of course, the Germans might still have difficulties getting the ore to their country. The bulk of the Swedish iron has always moved, even in summertime, through the ice-free Norwegian port of Narvik. Narvik has the best facilities for handling the ore and is nearest to the mines. Even if Germany controls Norway, iron ore shipments through the North Sea will still run the danger of constant interception by the British Navy. But once they're in control of Scandinavia, the Germans will presumably be able to commandeer all transportation facilities, including the railways, in order to get the ore moving. So far, I have emphasized the possible gains for the Germans. Their course, however, would also entail serious disadvantages. For the first time, they are being compelled to fight. The Nazis have to hurl their whole navy into the fray. Already they have suffered severe losses. And don't forget that the Allies can stand much larger naval losses than the Germans. For every Nazi warship sunk, the Allies can probably afford to lose two, or even more. The Germans have a good navy, but it is much smaller than in the World War. When the present war began, the British Navy had a four-to-one margin of superiority over the German. If the German fleet is severely crippled, the Nazi hold on Norway will be exceedingly precarious, and even the German coastline may become vulnerable to attack. But even if the Germans succeed in their plans of conquest, it will be only at the expense of a great drain on their resources, both of manpower and material. That wouldn't be so important if Germany had reserves as large as those of the Allies. But she doesn't. Extension of the military front would compel Germany to keep many more men under arms just at a time when there is already a severe shortage of labor at home. Large garrisons would have to be stationed in Scandinavia, not only to crush passive resistance by the inhabitants, but to ward off the ever-present threat of invasion by the Allies. Moreover, the Germans may have touched off the spark that will lead to a widespread conflagration throughout Europe. It may envelop the Balkans and the Low Countries. And if the Germans have to fight on many fronts, and on a scale comparable to the World War, they may become exhausted more quickly than we had believed. The military might of Nazi Germany is indeed great, but in a long war, the real sinews the real sources of strength are economic and financial, and in these respects, Germany is weaker than the Allies. Besides, the Scandinavian adventure may in the end prove a drain on German food supplies. That may seem surprising. We ordinarily think of Denmark, and even to some extent of Norway and Sweden, as agricultural countries. Yes, they do produce large quantities of meat and dairy products for export, Danish butter, eggs, and bacon are known the world over. Yet the Scandinavian countries as a whole are net importers of food. From such overseas countries as Argentina and Canada, 
they get grain for bread and livestock feed. They import fodder and a vast amount of vegetable oil seeds, which are crushed into oil cake for cattle feed. Denmark, for example, might be considered as a sort of dairy factory, which turns out meat, bacon, and butter, but only with the help of foreign raw materials. Without imports from overseas, Scandinavia cannot produce a surplus for export, whether to Germany or Britain, and it may even develop a deficit. This is not a happy prospect for Germany, which can't even feed its own people adequately. The lot of a German housewife and consumer is already a hard one. Bread and potatoes are still plentiful, but rations of other foodstuffs are exceedingly short. The average German eats 40% less meat than in 1938, and only on rare occasions can he get fish. His consumption of fat, including butter, margarine, and lard, has been cut almost in half. And he will be lucky if he gets one egg a week, 52 per year as compared with 124 in 1938. For Germany, the invasion of Scandinavia is there for a long shot. She is gambling on the hope that it will prove decisive. But there is little chance that it will be. The French and British now have their backs up. They are rather relieved to come to grips with the Germans at last. In fact, this may be just the opening they've been waiting for. Of course, it won't be easy to dislodge the Germans in Norway. They have stolen a march on Britain, and the Allies will find it difficult to land troops on the rocky and mountainous shores of Norway. Their task now is to cut German sea communications and prevent additional reinforcements from reaching Norway. Meanwhile, they are mustering a large expeditionary force with which they hope to establish full control in the far north. If the Allies succeed, they will have Germany by the throat. For without Scandinavian ore, Germany's arms factories may soon run out of supplies. But even if the Allies are not successful, the war is not lost for them. The farther the German front is extended, the more vulnerable Germany may become. Meanwhile, however, the neutrals have to suffer. The Danes have not felt the iron heel of the conqueror since 1864. And the Norwegians have been spared for centuries. They had become devoted to the ideal of peaceful progress. Their armament was weak. For the Danes, resistance to invasion was futile. And the Norwegians are putting up a fight only because they have the rugged coastline and the mountains on their side. The Swedes are stronger, but for the moment they are still neutral, even though they realize that control of their resources is the major Nazi objective. Their country may soon be invaded, particularly if the Allied Navy cuts Nazi sea communications with Norway. Thus the whole of Scandinavia will be engulfed in a war not of its own making. Who can tell now where the war will now spread? The peoples in the Low Countries and the Balkans are already beset by grave fears for the future. The development of a full-blown war between Germany and the Allies will enhance the importance of Holland as a basis of operations for both sides. If Holland becomes involved, Belgium can hardly remain neutral. And the Balkans have for some time become the scene of a sharp struggle for control of vital supplies, similar to that which precipitated war in Scandinavia. One would be foolhardy to make any prophecies under these circumstances. The invasion of Scandinavia has opened up countless possibilities. Ultimately, the chances of the Allies may be improved, especially if they can withstand the initial shocks of large-scale war. Mr. John C. DeWilder, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, was today's speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 8 West 40th Street, New York. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. This program has come to you from the studios of WFIL in Philadelphia. This is the National Broadcasting Company.